For me, I've always been concerned about the environment. That's been kind of a lifelong thing, although I think I sounded a bit more like a nutter um, <laughs> many years ago when I would describe what I expected to happen to this planet if we didn't intervene. Um, I've got this book here, I'll wave it around. Um, this actually says the decade that we could have changed everything was between 1979 and 1989, but I think I was aware of the climate crisis, the greenhouse gas. I mean, everything that was out, all the scientists were talking about this in the early 1970s when I was a teenager growing up. And I was deeply, deeply traumatized by the idea of complete environmental catastrophe. This is something that kept me awake when I was a teenager, made me rebel back then, mm -hmm. um, simply because I, I didn't know how to deal. I didn't know how to process this tremendous amount of rage, and just feeling overwhelmed with a sense of helplessness. I mean, I'm talking about, you know, 30 years ago, over 30 years ago. And, um, you know, so this has been with me throughout my life. Obviously, I've gone through periods of time where it's been less at the fore. But I am so grateful for Extinction Rebellion because it's enabled me to connect on a, on a very deep level uh, with people who have the same worldview and understand the same problems and also see it at the same level of emergency that I have always seen it. So it's great to have that sense of solidarity. It um, gives a sense of combined meaning and purpose and form. It does make us feel like we, can, we are doing something about it. Um, and I think that's really important because you just can't, you can't bear it. You can't bear you know, the sense of being overwhelmed. It's not, it's not something that one person on their own can, can manage. Mm -hmm. So the sense that we're sharing this together and we're going through the process of you know, uh, raising the issue, dealing with it, processing our feelings, you know, the grief, the rage, the everything. I mean, that's just really, really important. And, you know, of course, our hope is that by making enough noise, people are going to act. This is going to impact the government. We have seen a lot of changes. I think many more people are uh, waking up and moving from a position of maybe being blithely aware of some element of climate change to it really becoming, you know, in, in the nation's you know, forefront of the nation's thinking. Um, and I think it really has to be that way, you know, for things to change. I really just want to drive home the fact that things are not normal. We can't go on like it's business as usual. We absolutely cannot. I mean, just today there's an article in The Guardian, for example, about the air quality in India. I recently worked on a report with uh, a, a health journalist on air pollution and how this is a silent killer. And I mean, England um, doesn't even rate on the, uh, like London wouldn't even rate on the 100 most polluted cities in the world. Mm -hmm. And yet people, children are dying of asthma in London mm -hmm. that is directly related to air pollution. So we know that this is actually something right on our doorstep. So we're talking about the UK and influencing things in the UK. What we have now is an opportunity to do something preventive because otherwise the situation is just going to be so huge, you know, that it's going to be completely unmanageable. Mm -hmm. So we need to be proactive about it. And that is the thing that I would want to drive home, drive home to them. I think we've tried appealing on the emotional level about children, about grandchildren. You know, it's kind of hard to imagine that somebody could be so cold and so callous mm -hmm. that they wouldn't actually understand that, that they wouldn't get that message and they wouldn't be able to drive it home to them. So I think that, you know, along with that, we need to look at the costs, you know, how this is going to impact business, how this is going to impact, um, you know, people's livelihoods, um, how this is going to impact so many more things on such a difference and it's going to impact uh, transport, the infrastructure. I don't personally believe that the infrastructure in the UK is, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not really to a standard that it's going to be able to cope. Mm -hmm. And I think that if we don't actually get thinking, get acting now, um, the scope for damage is going to be astronomical. I don't actually have children. My husband uh, has four grown children. 
and 10 grandchildren with another one on the way. Mm -hmm. So um, I have to say, I because I, I mentioned that as a teenager, mm -hmm. I, was, I was traumatized by worrying about the end of the world. And um, it just made me you know, think that I, I really, much as I love children, and I would have loved to have had children of my own, I would have loved to have had children with my husband. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I just didn't really feel like this was possible. And I felt like it would be so unjust and unfair to bring children into the world, mm -hmm. a world that is uncertain, a world that has very little future. Mm -hmm. When we had our, our XR debrief meeting recently, we were all sitting in a circle and we were asked to envision what um, our 10 years into the future and what our uh, 10 years in the future person would, s you know, what we would say to ourselves. And I am, um, I'm a kind of person who quite often sees things very strongly in a visual sense. And immediately what came to my mind, I had this very, very vivid picture of an African man with a poor malnourished child struggling onto a very small boat and escaping from a completely devastated, blighted landscape where there was absolutely nothing growing, everything was dead. Mm -hmm. And that's what I saw 10 years from now. Mm -hmm. And that was such a clear picture that that's actually what I believe will happen. Mm -hmm. So the message, the only message I could find to say uh, at that time, what would I say to myself? So we'd still have to believe against all you know, evidence to the contrary, and we must fight. That's all that we can do. We have to fight. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I feel that engaging with Extinction Rebellion, uh, engaging the protests that I've been involved in with um, HS2, trying to write about it, trying to do everything that I'm trying to do now, um, devoting so much time and energy to this, it is actually the most important thing that I am doing. And I feel that pretty much all my life was preparation for this time. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely why I'm with XR and I'm just actually thrilled and grateful that such a movement exists. When I was at the, um, the finance action in Bank, I was sat down on the ground uh, with other protesters blocking the street around Bank Tube Station and that was just during the time that the XR scientists were talking and giving a very, you know, impassioned and well-reasoned, um, you know, scope of what's going on, why they're involved. And during that time, the police were kind of being a little bit, you know, pushy with us, trying to get us to move on. I was a little bit um, annoyed, I'll put it that way, by because there was this huge queue of people being shoved by the police behind me, and I'm all of 5'1", you know, I just kind of felt like I was going to be trampled, like at a stadium or something. So that was kind of scary. But anyway, I started talking to this policewoman, and one of the things I said to her, and I think is very unique and distinct about XR, and it's actually really impressed me, is that considering we have no leader, no exact hierarchical structure, I said to her, of all the things that I've observed in my life, and particularly in my 30 years of living in, in the UK, it's the most well-organized group that I've ever been a part of. It's, and it's really, you know, it is well-organized, but it, it functions kind of like a, an organic, you know, you think about all the, the animals that migrate every year. They don't always necessarily communicate well. We don't know. They maybe use some kind of communication signals to each other, but they all are moving with instinct and purpose in the same direction. And that's, um, that's what I feel about XR. It's, and so it's wonderful to be part of that because you just feel that you're in something that's got a movement and a purpose, and that movement, that purpose is powering it such that it doesn't really need any external ladders or layers of hierarchy. And so it's just amazing to see that as, you know, how effective that actually is.